gonna put this on. Put this on. And uh, West Dublin one's a lot closer. <coughs> okay, West shall we uh, pray? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are truly grateful and thankful for this opportunity to plunge into the depths of your word in these days when uh, so many, so many do not desire to study, yet we thank you for preserving a remnant that hunger and thirst not only after your righteousness, but after your word. And we give you all the praise and glory for giving us this appetite. And we thank you for each one who was here today and has made it their business and gone out of their way to be sharpening their minds and hearts and studying your word. And uh, thank you for my precious brothers and sisters here today. And we pray as we launch out today uh, the ministry of Christ Pastor Seminary here in the USA, here in Christ Bible Church. We ask for your blessing upon every facet of it and upon our lecture today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I want to say greetings to everyone. We know everyone, so there's no introductions. Uh, we're all from Christ Bible Church. Um, and I'm so blessed that all of you have come out today. Uh, it really encourages me to see so much, so much interest from the members of Christ Bible Church in taking this class and studying His Word. And so uh, we have two things to do. We have an application information form. We already have most of this information in our church directory, but we need to have a database for record-keeping purposes in a seminary database just so we have record of everyone who has taken the course. So for future reference, if, if you want to know which courses you've taken and or if you're inquiring into transferring those courses in terms of the credit to other institutions, we'll have everything on record here. Okay? Um, we are not seeking uh, regional or state accreditation. Uh, this is just our own church seminary, but uh, we will approach it in a very organized way uh, so that uh, uh, all things are done decently and in order. Well, let's uh, begin with just some basic information so that you know your way around here. Obviously, you found the place. If you haven't been here yet, there's nothing to it. It's just 450 square feet in this place, but we're making full use of it, and we thank God for it. The Bible tells us, do not despise the day of small things. But right now, it's adequate, so we're thankful for it. We, the two closets in the back, about 75% of them contain the inventory of Christ Pastor Seminary, so if you haven't seen them yet, we'll open them up afterwards, and you'll see all of the books and materials and publications in the ministry. Come on in, brother. There's a seat right here. One, one left for you there. There you go. And uh, could somebody pass the catechism uh, to Seth? And it's the sign-in sheet behind you, Will. <clears throat> and uh, does everyone Pastor, have a pen? The, pass the, the, um, the yes. Let's go ahead and pass those out. They're not in the binder. Um, they were part of the letters that were sent out, as well as <coughs> it's a course description, uh, as well as it was in the letter on Sunday uh, that announced this class. So we're passing around a course description. So if you haven't looked at that yet, we will go over it in a minute. So just be a little patient. So um, the coffee shop next door opens at 7 o'clock Monday through Friday. But unfortunately on Saturday, it doesn't open until 9.30. So if you have to use the restroom, hey, Philip. Here you go. Reminder, someone please give uh, Philip a Baptist Catechism textbook as well as the sign-in sheet and the course description. There's a clipboard with the sign-in sheet somewhere. Right here. Yes. Okay. Seth, you need to sign in on that clipboard and Philip, you need to sign in on the clipboard. Okay, so the bathroom is at the Christian Bookstore and it opens in seven minutes. If you need to use the restroom, and I know you're tightly squeezed in there, please just get up during the lecture and go out. God willing, next week we'll have a better configuration here 
and I apologize for the inconvenience of being so tightly squeezed in here like sardines. But hey, uh, I'm motivated uh, by your hunger and thirst after the Word of God. They do have coffee as well, so if you want to, when you use the restroom, if you want to step out and get coffee, we'll probably take a break in about 35 minutes for you to squeeze over and get a cup of coffee if you really want a cup. If you're like me, um, I'm a coffee drinker, uh, and you haven't had your cup of coffee yet this morning, then you'll probably be, uh, your, your veins will be crying out for fresh caffeine. Parking. Uh, we have plenty of parking on the weekend in the back here, as you can see. Um, beginning next week, okay, punctuality is important because today's uh, lesson is a short one. We're just going to cover the introduction. There's an introductory uh, lesson. We're going to cover that, and the rest of the time we'll be talking about some of the details of the class. But we will get into the course material today in a little while. But punctuality is important because uh, most of the work is going to be done at home. We've tried to reduce class time to a bare minimum because we know everyone has a busy lifestyle and works and so forth, and reserve the actual, most of the study time and reflection for your time at home to work around your schedule. So that's why it's important to be here at 9.30 because we only have an hour and a half class time twice a month except for one month, okay? When um, you said 9.30, do you mean 9? Uh, 9, 9 o'clock, excuse me, 9 o'clock. Be here punk, uh, sharply. Come on in, Mel. Uh, we need one more chair. Let's let's go. Uh, we have one in here. Andy, if you could just slide down just a little bit. As a matter of fact, if I could steal your chair and give it to Mel, we'll replace it in a second. Okay. Melanie, Philip, if you could squeeze in a little closer to Will. Um, man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's on. That camera's actually on. Yeah, that's right. So if we could uh, put it right in front of you, like in the middle of the table back there, Melanie can sit there. If you don't mind being... So if someone has to go out and use the restroom, you're going to have to get up and slide your chair in if you don't mind. I'm so sorry. Next week we'll have this a lot better organized. We'll probably have one or two tables out. And uh, so you got another chair? Okay. Uh, if need be, Danny, we may have to go into that closet and you can hand a couple of chairs. Okay? Actually, they will be coming, so we better do that now. So we need two more chairs. It's her closet. They're in, okay, perfect. So if. Uh, Actually, you know what? Take a couple of chairs from here and we'll just grab them. Okay, let's go ahead and hand those forward. Brother, uh, Brother Rob, if you could. Yeah. Okay, there you go. All right. So if, if anyone else comes, we'll just put them in my office. <laughs> Seth, Seth, one more. Oh, I'll get it. This is what you call using your space wisely. Well, using your space. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll just leave it. Okay, so class time will be twice a month except for August. We only have one class in August. Did everyone get the... Um, let's see. The class schedule. The class schedule on page two. Is the class schedule listed? No? Okay. So, you um, didn't get page two, that's what it was. Page two is the first page, actually. Okay. So, the class schedule you have either in your email that I gave you or it was on the announcement last Lord's Day. So, you have it with you somewhere. Okay, you got it? So, if you have it with you, take it out. There's only two classes in May. May 10th today, and then two weeks from today. There's two classes in June, two in July, one in August, and two in September. We have a total of nine classes, okay? So we're asking you to make all of them if you can. We understand emergencies, 
And if you absolutely can't make a particular class for illness or work related or whatever the legitimate reason is, that's fine. We're going to be recording it on the tape as well as as long as you do the homework assignments and uh, you'll be good. You'll be good. So nine sessions all together including today. And uh, the classes are important because um, they help to clarify a lot of the material. I'm sure some of the material will, will produce questions, maybe a little confusion, and the purpose of the class is to clarify it. And uh, when you talk about studying the doctrine of the scriptures, all kinds of questions come up in our thinking. And so questions during class time help to fill in a lot of these empty spaces or questions. Let's talk about the format of the class. The format will be a combination of lecture and participation. We want your participation. Participation is very important, so questions or even comments are encouraged and solicited. Now remember, we only have an hour and a half for each session, and we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we're not going to be doing intimate lectures. You're going to be studying on your own and fill in all the material. When we gather together, um, most of our time will be spent in discussing the material you have already studied. Otherwise, we just won't have enough time. We'll have to have like a four-unit class where you meet four days a week, like in a university setting, to cover every single aspect of the material. Okay. So when you come together in class time, it will be assumed that you've all, you're already prepared uh, intellectually and, and doctrinally by reading and studying the material. So that will help us cover a lot more ground. So, um, but I will guide us through the material. We'll be using uh, the material, the study guide, and the textbook that was handed out. If you need a copy of the Baptist Catechism, raise your hand and we'll pass one to you. We have some back here. Did everyone get a study guide? The Loose Leaf Binder study guide? No? No? Here you go. Thank you. Okay, um, so that's the format. It's lecture um, and questions and comments. Okay, keep the comments brief if you can. I certainly welcome them because we'll be covering a lot of material. Let's talk about the course objective and requirements. So I handed out a course objective. Uh, all of you should have it there. Okay, um, course description. Let's start at the top. Systematic Theology 101. That's the title of the course, a basic theology course. The purpose of this course is to establish a working knowledge of the essential doctrines of the Christian faith. This course will acquaint you with biblical and theological concepts so that you may confidently discuss the teachings of Scripture and how they apply to life and ministry. We're also going to be having much practical feedback and input from both ends. We don't want it to be just pure academic or pure theology. We're looking to apply this as much as we can to our daily lives as well as to our ministries uh, that God has called us to. All lectures will be held on Saturday between 9 and 10.30 a.m. approximately every two weeks at Christ Bible Church right here in the office. Course objective. Systematic Theology 101 covers all major areas of Christian doctrine. When I, major is the important word here. You'll notice that in the textbook, there's nothing on spiritual gifts, for example. We can expand, certainly, the chapter on, on the doctrine of the church to include spiritual gifts and other important elements related to the church. But this textbook is not exhaustive, but it, it does cover all the major doctrines of the Christian faith. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, the goal is to familiarize you with basic concepts and terminology necessary to understand God's word more accurately and deeply. You'll find a lot of terms in the catechism that you may not recognize. I would encourage you getting a dictionary and perhaps investing a few dollars in a theological dictionary. A normal dictionary will just have really basic religious and theological terms but a theological dictionary will expand the, um, the jargon that you will read in this catechism to include other terms, secondary terms, 
that are not covered by a dictionary, not defined by a dictionary. Certainly you can Google these terms, these secondary terms if you like, but it never hurts to, and we have the library here. This library and in my office is 38 years of book collecting on my part, and I've made it available to everyone at Christ Bible Church. I've already had uh, some folks uh, lending, borrowing rather, some books, and uh, we have a sign-up sheet for that, or will have a sign-up sheet for that. But uh, we have, I probably have four or five theological dictionaries back there. So if you want to save your time in doing some research till Saturday when you're here, that's fine. Uh, or you could just Google it or invest in a dictionary yourself. In this course, you'll obtain an understanding of how the great doctrines of Scripture are blended together and will be able to apply those teachings to life and ministry. Upon completion of this course and the next one in the series, Systematic Theology 102, you should be able to, number one, summarize what the Bible teaches on subjects commonly taught in theological literature. That is general theological literature, which this library represents. So after these two courses, 101 and 102, you'd be able to pretty much understand most of what you read in these books. Not everything, but most of what you read in these books. It helps us make up a lot of time so that we don't have to uh, constantly research terms and words. Uh, but when you go through a course like this, you have a wider uh, background and foundation in understanding these definitions and terms so you could just keep on moving in your reading and in your studying. It, it certainly helps to make your study time more efficient to have a solid theological foundation and understanding. Um, upon completion of the, okay, number two, investigate ways in which Bible doctrines are joined together by the underlying themes of God's sovereignty and lordship. These two themes are critical and they pretty much relate directly or indirectly to every doctrine in the Bible. When you study any doctrine, you're always asking yourself, how does this apply to my life? Well, most of the time it all goes back to God's sovereignty and God's lordship. He's in control. He's in charge of my life. Therefore, how in a practical way do I relate to this doctrine? Is there, is there something about this doctrine that God wants me to submit to, want me to surrender something to him over concerning the fact that he's lord of my life, he's sovereign, he's in charge of every single life. So uh, the objective of this course is to help you connect the doctrines, the basic doctrines of the Bible with the two overriding dominant, dominating doctrines, pragmatically speaking, of God's sovereignty and lordship. Okay? Number three, understand important theological terms and concepts to use in future theological studies. Again, as you proceed deeper into other theological courses or just on your own, um, you will be able, again, to understand these terms as you go into higher areas of study and learning in theology that uh, where you will pick up new terms. But if you have that foundation, it will certainly help you as you proceed upward in your study of theology. Uh, the two courses that will cover this entire book, Systematic Theology 101 and 102, are just basic foundational theology courses to give you grounding in the Word of God. But there's many other doctrines, important doctrines of God's Word, that future theology courses will cover. So we expect to have four or five theology courses in the end uh, when we're finished developing a curriculum. We have about 16 to 18 courses already which are being used mostly in Lagos at our first branch of the seminary there. Those of you who read the history letter was just a short history of the seminary. Uh, we have 12 graduates. Um, you know, the seminary, in my, in my view, the Lord has really blessed it in Lagos because you have a seminary situation functioning in the worst possible setting, the worst possible milieu, environment, uh, where everything tends to be against such a institution of learning there. But the Lord has blessed it, and we've graduated since 06, uh, the first year of the seminary there, 12 men, uh, and has... Uh, Three of those men are members of Sava Grace Bible Church in Lagos, and two of them are functioning in leadership positions other than pastor. And, uh, but the rest are pastors or aspiring pastors, and uh, the word is getting out there by these uh, alumni and others. And so we have a growing, a growing branch. I think there's 20-plus students 
official members in the seminary there right now. And it's very encouraging to see uh, what God is doing. Uh, so, um, number four, apply uh, the course objective number four is apply good theological m methods in analyzing issues not specifically discussed in this course. Uh, the doctrine or discipline of apologetics and many other large components of theology come in. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Do some stuff real quick. Hi, I'm Joe. Nice That's to meet you. I'm Robbie. Ro everybody, this is Robbie. How's it going? Yeah. Do me a favor and fill that out for me when you get a chance. And there's a sign-in sheet behind you on the table and a book. Okay, so number four, this course will help you apply good theological methods in analyzing issues not specifically discussed in this course. So as you go through this course, you'll see that there's an order there's a logical, reasonable order and structure to doctrine. Your mind will become uh, structured to think according to this orderly biblical way of approaching the study of doctrine. So that in the future you will apply the same kinds of methods and analysis that your mind has been trained to develop in this course. When you study theology consistently, almost every day, your mind is constantly being replunged back into this whole ocean of truth in the Bible. Your, your mind is challenged to study it in an organized way. And not only is this a method a reflection of the mind of God, who is a God of order, but also um, that's where the scripture brings you in your mind, your cognitive thinking. You, you want to be able to separate this truth from that truth, and you want to be able to relate this truth to that truth. The only way you could do it is in a coherent, organized, structured way. Theology and the study of theology has inherently in it the, the dynamic of, of challenging you and forcing you to, to sh uh, structure your mind as you approach the study of the Word of God. Number six, the course will place a high value on doctrine for spiritual growth for yourself and those you teach. I trust that all of you will use the theology you already have learned and will learn in this course um, as uh, in the world, wherever you go. This knowledge will, will be imparted through you and your ministry to your families, your children, your co-workers. Perhaps you have a Bible study or so uh, maybe someday you'll be a missionary. Wherever you go, this knowledge cannot be taken from you, and you will use it. And it will help you grow, too. It will stretch your imagination, stretch your mind, stretch your heart to comprehend and understand God. And it, it will bless you. It will lead you to worship. Your, your understanding of God when you study theology goes from a small, uh, a small amount of knowledge, and it keeps being stretched to... After long periods of study, your understanding of God is this big, so to speak. And it certainly facilitates and motivates your worship. The more you know about God and his character, his nature, uh, it, it, it moves, moves us to worship. Number seven, this course will examine your own spiritual life in light of biblical doctrine in order to identify areas in which you need to grow. And that will just naturally come up in your study. Okay, let's look at the course requirements. We're under uh, the course description, Systematic Theology course description. In this course, you will be required to complete all assignments in the student study guide that are due for each class section approximately every two weeks. So two weeks from today and thereafter, I'm going to have a sign-in sheet like the one here. On it, you will have your, the name, and then it will ask you, did you complete your assignment? The only thing you're required really to do is complete your written assignment. All the information that you need to know to answer the questions in the study guide are contained in the textbook. And you're required to look for those answers in the chapter or the question you're studying 
and write it down. So it's in terms of uh, academically, we're not asking you to memorize a whole lot of information, to stay up late nights and study. It's a real low impact class in terms of uh, for working people like you and me. Uh, we have low low demand on uh, classes, class attendance, and uh, you're not having to, to do a whole lot of memorization. The world's approach, the secular approach to learning, generally speaking, and I know Brother Will is our resident educator, is through memorization. Most of the information that we're, we receive in university and college and high school settings, we're asked to memorize and then regurgitate that for a test. And the measure and standard uh, that is used to determine uh, competency and learning and understanding in certain subject matter and for future positions is whether you be, you're able to uh, you're able to bring that information back up and put it on a test uh, and, and if you get a good grades on your test that's the measure of how successful you are and I'm sure educators today are rethinking the whole process here and there to find better ways to educate people and I know probably Brother Will can spend hours and hours up here like he does all the time flying all over to teach teachers how to teach. But the point is the biblical method of education, God's philosophy of ed education, is meditation Amen. as opposed to memorization. Now there's a place for memorization. Don't get me wrong. I'm not putting down memorization. God has given us an intellect and a mind to use for his glory. And part of that is memorizing truth. Many of us felt uh, that we were wasting our time in high school or in college taking some courses that we would never use and would say, why am I memorizing this information? I'm never going to use this. But when you memorize the Bible, the Word of God, the Scripture, and you memorize information connected with that Scripture, it's never wasted. Right. It, it enhances your own relationship with God and also it strengthens your convictions. When you get truth down, distilled down into your heart and mind. It deepens conviction. And the Holy Spirit uses conviction to influence other people that you witness to, that you, that you share the Word of God with. And the Holy Spirit uses conviction to, again, enhance and enlarge your worship experience. When you're convicted by the Word of God, usually the first thing you do is you are driven to the Lord Himself to have dealings with Him concerning these fresh convictions that He is establishing in your heart. So um, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's important to use our minds, but the world's process is, is primarily through memorization. And I know that many fields have internships and they have practicum and they have all kinds of experimental ways to learn things to apply in a practical way what some fields of study teach in uh, university to their students. But generally, the main mode is through memorization. But in the Bible, it's meditation. You see, we have a, a very important factor, a very important person involved in the learning process when we study the scriptures. We cannot discount him. As a matter of fact, he's next to the scripture. He is the most important part in the process, Amen. the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He's the teacher. He's called teacher. Amen. He's called the spirit of truth. And it's his job to take truth and to bring it down and implant it into your heart until it becomes part of you. Right. Because when it becomes part of you, you will not very quickly renounce it. You will not very easily walk away from it. It will become part of you, period. No matter what loss you may suffer when challenged by an employer or challenged by someone who's persecuting you, to renounce your faith, to recant, or to deny the Lord Jesus himself and his truth, you will not easily do that. When the Holy Spirit takes truth and makes it a part of your mind, your heart, your will, and your life. So as you meditate on truth, uh, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in in his subtle secret way and begins to open your mind and open your heart and then move your feet to apply what you're learning. It, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is a very important part of the process. And everyone meditates on a different level. In college or university, everyone is expected to conform to this compartmentalized learning process where they start on a certain date and they end on a certain date. When, when you study the Bible, on the other hand, the Holy Spirit is totally in control of that learning process. Uh, I know many people, and I've taught many people, 
and I've been on the other side as a student at Bible college and seminary where not everyone was able to fit in the school's timetable when they graduated or when they finished a course many of the students didn't understand what they what they learned everyone is on a different level in terms of the Holy Spirit uh, and and the growth and understanding timetable that he has for each Christian I, I'll teach uh, in my ministry believers a certain truth and they'll get it the first time they hear it and I've been teaching that same truth to other Christians who are in our church who still don't get it after hearing the same thing repeated for 20 years what, what's the what's the decide the difference the difference is the Holy Spirit Amen. so timing wise he has his own timetable for teaching us truths. That's why, you know, if we embrace the doctrines of grace and you've shared tapes and articles and books and verbally with others to bring them into an understanding of these doctrines and some of our Arminian brethren uh, still don't get it. Why? Why? The Holy Spirit has to open their minds Amen. and their hearts. And so he, he focuses on taking the truth usually slowly and incrementally and bringing it down because we couldn't handle it all at first, at once as a baby Christian, first month, first year. You imagine if we were overwhelmed with all the truth at once, we wouldn't be able to uh, uh, digest it. Just like a three-month-old baby cannot, cannot digest steak, he'll spit it right up because his, his infrastructure, his digestive tract is not fully developed yet. The same thing spiritually. So the Holy Spirit in his own way brings us along slowly, usually. Some people are accelerated a lot faster and others slower. It's all his timetable. But he has to perform a very vital work, which is to open the mind, shine in the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ into our minds, communicating truth, cognitive, doctrinal truth. And that truth is like a light shining in a dark place. It enlightens the mind. It'll blow us away uh, about uh, learning something connected with the nature and being of God that we never knew before. Um, and it, it's just amazing. All right, let's move on then uh, in terms of the, uh, the course requirements. Um, so every class session, um, make sure you do the assignment. Uh, it's going to be an honesty policy. I'm not going to ask you to turn anything in. I'm just going to ask you and ask you to acknowledge it on the, on the uh, paper. Did you do the assignment? Okay? That's it. Uh, the other uh, requirement is class discussion. All right? We don't want anyone falling asleep. I mean, again, the, the motivation for this class has got to be self-generated. Okay? Um, Textbook. The textbook is a Baptist catechism with commentary by Dr. Downing. You all have a copy. If you need an extra one, keep the one you have. Um, a student study guide based on a Baptist catechism by Dr. Downing, prepared by Dr. Stan Murrow, my good friend. 129 page study guide is right here. This study guide that you have received encompasses both Systematic Theology 101 and Systematic Theology 102. Okay, so this is the same study guide for both courses. Um, now, let's look at, uh, let's continue here. The textbook, student study guide, and course tuition are free of charge. Reading. During the weeks between lectures, students are required to read the assigned chapters in the textbook and do the corresponding assignments in the study guide. So let's, let's all take a, uh, uh, a textbook. Okay, and uh, let's turn in your textbooks to um, page 28. I'm not using the introduction as an example. I'm going to use uh, in part one, okay, question one on page 28. Um, so let's first look at this chapter. Okay, so this chapter is two pages, page 28 and 29, okay, representing questions. Now, you all know that Dr. Downing chose the format, format of a catechism. There are other formats he could have chose to communicate this truth, this theology, but he chose the, the format of a catechism. 
A catechism is a question and answer format of, of learning and teaching, right? You ask a question, for example, this question, one, what is the only inspired, infallible, and inerrant truth for man? Answer, the only inspired, infallible, and inerrant truth for man is the inscripturated word of God, the Bible, okay? Now, he uses a format. After the, he gives the answer, he chooses the most important scriptures in the Bible to prove his answer. In this case, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and Matthew 4, 4. So he'll actually write out those most important verses related to this answer or this doctrine of the infallibility of the scripture. Okay, But then he will put other cross-references related to the topic or the doctrine under that. So he will write out, in his estimation, what the most important scriptures are connected with that doctrine. And then underneath that, he will, he will have C also, and then he's got, uh, what, four other scriptures here that, that connect to it. You got it? And that, that saves time, because if, if you want to know the answer to a question and you only want the one or two most important verses, he's already got them written out for you here. Okay, if you want to do a deeper study, then you can look up the other ones. Then under the scripture references, he's got commentary in which he enlarges gives further explanation on his answer. In this particular case, a page and a half of commentary. And very often in the commentary, he'll have other scripture references quoted. He explains what he means in, in detail, but he, it's not exhaustive detail. I have some theology books that they'll go 50 pages to give an answer to this question. about the. I have whole books on the infallibility and inspiration of the scriptures. A whole book written on that one subject. Here, he summarizes concisely in a page and a half what he means by the fact that the scriptures are the only infallible, inerrant, uh, inspired word of God. Now, that's very helpful, isn't it? Where you could just get a distillation in, a, in a, like a page and a half of what it means. I like conciseness. I never, as I've grown older, I've become more concise. I've been accused of being verbose and... Uh, in many different situations. One of the things that helped me is my years on the radio. I had a program manager when I was on uh, KFAX, the sister station, um, and every once in a while when Jesse Gastan and I were on the radio together, uh, he'd do a debriefing of he and I. Um, and he'd come in and he, he, he just, he was so gracious, he'd come in and he'd say, he kept saying, economy of words, economy of words. And I look at Jesse and Je Jesse look at me, economy of words. He's saying, use fewer words. Be economical with your words. But he didn't say who. I'd look at Jesse, Jesse would look at me, and we keep on going. But I applied that. I applied it to my on air uh, broadcast time and ministry, as well as in my pulpit ministry. Um, my pulpit ministry is the last one to come along, okay? As you well know, I'm still working on that. I admit it. I admit it. Pray for me. Pray for me. I'm trying to keep it under an hour, and I'm doing a pretty good job at that keeping it at an hour or under. Anyway, Dr. Downing, um, you know, he wrote this book late in life. He's not only a, a tremendous pastor, but he's one of the best contemporary theologians I know of. He has written about 15 or 20 books like this in great detail on other theological subjects. And uh, uh, I was telling someone the other day that was in here for counseling who asked me for a recommendation on a commentary on the book of Hebrews. And uh, I, uh, rec I have, oh, I don't know, ten commentaries on the book of Hebrews there. And I recommended Arthur W. Pink's commentary, very thick one on the book of Hebrews. Superb! Mm -hmm. But I mentioned to the person, if you read Pink on the Gospel of John, his commentary, it's about as thick. It's uh, not as good in terms of the weightiness of it, in terms of picking up the spiritual nuances and making practical applications in his commentary. Well, Pink wrote the Gospel of John when he was a young man, and he wrote the, the commentary on Hebrews when he was an old man, just a couple years before he died. And you can see the difference in learning, the difference in the gravity and sobriety of his, of his mind, as well as in his practical applications. He's so much more comfortable in doing that. I would think that in the, the Gospel of John, you'd be able to really have one practical application after another, but 
there are some, but, but in Hebrews, which is more theologically oriented, he has twice as many practical apps. Well, that represents his own spiritual growth, his own learning, his own pilgrimage, spiritually and otherwise. And this book represents the same thing. He has, uh, it would have probably been a three-volume commentary 30 years ago, or a three-volume theology 30 years ago, but he distilled it down into this bite-sized pieces, and I love that. Okay, so, and, and then on page 30, at the top of the page, he goes right into question two. So, um, each question will be anywhere from two to five pages in length. There are 172 questions and answers, each one of them representing a doctrine or a, a part of a doctrine, uh, uh, okay, in the scripture. Every, again, every major doctrine is addressed in here in a concise way with all the major scripture references. It is a theology book in itself. It's a, a theological library in itself. He did a masterful, brilliant job, and uh, he, is, he is indeed a gifted man of God. Uh, pray for his health, though. He's uh, 73, and he keeps telling me, I want to retire, Brother Joe. I want to retire, but I can't. I can't. And uh, it's a long story why he can't. But... Um, uh, anyway, um, so that is uh, the format of the Baptist Catechism. And so the point is that um, the textbook, all right, you, you read the, you look at the study guide. All right, now let's go to the study guide. If you turn to page um, three in the study guide, the binder. On the front of the binder and the sleeve, you have the nice uh, uh, title page with a little color, a little red color in there, with a picture that Pastor Stan put. I, one of it's some kind of a Greek meeting there with a philosopher or something. I don't know. But if you turn to uh, page three, the preface, this catechism is an introductory study of Bible doctrine. is in the form of a catechism for the ease of study, organization of subjects, and memorization. It is intended for use in our own assembly. We believe it advantageous for fathers to use in family worship, for Bible classes, homeschooling classes, for older children to use, and for the use of all who would desire to obtain a basic grasp of Bible doctrine. As such, it is intended for daily reading. This is a Baptist catechism. It is intended for our Baptist people. Now let me stop right here, okay? Dr. Downing, I bless his heart, I love him to death, and I'll never be able to touch the hem of his garment when it comes to learning. But uh, he is a die-in-the-wool Baptist. He loves his Baptist heritage, and most of the time he's not ashamed of it, although he does not make it a test of fellowship. He relates to people of all different kinds of uh, denominational and a uh, background and tradition, theological tradition to a certain extent. But he is, he is out front very often, if you read enough of his writings, uh, where he's not so subtle in emphasizing Baptist doctrine. Now, Christ Bible Church embraces most Baptist distinctives, especially when it comes to the infallibility of Scripture and those distinctives, distinctives related to it. Another one would be baptism by the mode of immersion. But we're, we're not very prideful about or proud about uh, our identification with certain Baptist doctrines and practices just because they're Baptist. I'm not saying he is, but there's a word of explanation needed because in his preface he puts this in here. Now I've already suggested to him, and um, I can do this because uh, I've known him for 30 plus years and we have a very good and close relationship. I said, Brother Downing, I said, you got to consider taking the name Baptist out of the title. Okay, because this book is being spread all over the world. I've taken it to Nigeria. I've taken it to other places. We've sent it all around the world. And I said, you don't want to unnecessarily cause people to stumble who could benefit from the theology in this book. Uh, but when they see the word Baptist, they won't, they won't break the cover of the book because they don't like Baptists. They're prejudiced against Baptists for whatever reason. So I said, wouldn't it be wise just take Baptist out and put a Bible catechism 
or a catechism, whatever, redo the term, you know, you'll have much more hearing all around the world. He's thinking about it. He's thinking about it. I don't know if I'll ever uh, hear, but he is a dear brother. Don't get me wrong. He, 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 he it's, his, his love for, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> smaller font. His love for Baptist teaching is because it's Bible teaching, not because it's necessarily Baptistic as a denomination. Uh, cause, because I know him well, but um, and he so he's thinking about that. Anyway, uh, I, I I felt it important that we explain that. So if you if you this term baptism comes up in any of his introductions or preface or even in the book somewhere, and usually in the book he he, he doesn't come across as as being exclusivistic when he uses the term Baptist, as if unless you're a Baptist you haven't arrived yet. He doesn't come across as as that. Uh, in that way in the book. But uh, in the preface, you know, maybe a little, so I felt uh, the need to elaborate. While we have much in common with other Christians, you see, that's good, we also have our own distinctives which we hold to be scriptural. These are emphasized and detailed when necessary. This is a catechism with commentary. The basic and salient issues under each heading are briefly explained and discussed in an orderly manner as such, it becomes an introductory manual for doctrinal study. So he talks about the format there, which we've already gone through. It is our intention, should divine providence provide the time and facility, to enlarge this introductory work into a much larger work, which would make use of exegetical, historical, and theological notes, studies, and quotations from various authors. May this elementary work prove in the kind providence of God to be both acceptable and useful among our Baptist people. And everybody! Okay. Now. Um, Protestant people. Yes. Even unsaved people can read this and get saved. Okay, that's what we're hoping for. Or at least those who go through this study and take it out to unsaved people. You never know how God is going to use his word. Amen? Um, so... All right, any questions so far? Brother Walter. Uh, Pastor Joe, something about the cover design I noticed. It says it was by Dr. Paul Nelson, and it's St. Paul before the Periopagus. Thank you. By Raphael. That's right. And I think it looks like that's what Stan Harrell Yes, he used that. Thank you for clarifying that. I read that before, but I just forgot. Okay, um, let's take a, if we can do this, a five-minute break. All right? Do you want to take a five-minute break, or do you want to just keep going to the end? Keep All right, let's keep going. If you need to use the restroom, go. Get your coffee, use the restroom, and go. Okay. Um, now, where am I here? So bring writing materials to the class, pen and paper. You can also bring a recorder or have somebody do that. Tim is recording the uh, lecture, so if you need to get a copy because you miss a session, please do so. Um, let's, uh, let's turn to the introduction on page four in the study guide. Page four in the study guide, not in the book. Okay, uh, actually... So there are ten, there are ten sections in the book, um, or ten parts. If you look at the top of page four, table of contents, introduction. Okay, in the introduction, which we'll we'll just skim through today, there are these six things we're going to look at. All right, and then next is part one. Under each one of these ten parts, there's a certain amount of questions or doctrines that he deals with. In part one. He discusses the believer and his God in questions 1 through 6. Uh, part of that discussion is the scriptures, the purpose of man, the, the great object of knowledge, how we may know God, what are the two types of revelation, and what, the importance of the script, what are the importance of the scriptures. Okay, So those six questions all right, in part 1. All right, Then in part 2, you've got the scriptures as the word of God. And that, that covers, uh, I don't know, about 12 questions. Part 3 on page 5, 
God's nature, purpose, and, and character. He's got nine questions connected with that. Part four, God's works of creation and providence. Again, several questions. Part five, sin and law. Part six on page seven, the redemptive purpose and the redeemer. Then he's going into the work of Christ here. Very deeply, his offices. Part seven, salvation and Christian experience. Many questions connected with these practical and doctrinal aspects concerning conversion, effectual calling, what is regeneration, what is saving faith. A really good justification, adoption, sanctification. This is a very long section which goes uh, from question 78 all the way through question 132. Actually, we're going to break that section down into two. Now, and then on uh, page 11 at the top, Section 8 is Evangelism in the Gospel Ministry. Section 9, the Church and the Ordinances. And Section 10, Final Things. This course, Systematic Theology 101, will cover the first seven sections. All the material in the first seven sections will be covered in Systematic Theology 101. Those are uh, questions 1 through 133. So we're going to cover two-thirds of the book in this first course, and then one-third of the book in Systematic Theology 102, okay? Um, so we will finish on page 254 in your textbook. This course ends at page 254 in your textbook. Now, this, uh, yeah, and Systematic Theology 2 covers questions 134 through 172, the rest of the book, the textbook and the study guide. All right. Now let's look at um, the introduction. Let's turn back to page four. Okay. Or actually, let's go to page fourteen. So let's turn to page fourteen. If you look at the schedule for the nine classes, all right, uh, week two, okay, and I'm going to hand this, I'm going to probably send you all an email. Make sure you give me your email. I'll put this in the email so you'll know. For next week, you are responsible to cover part one. All of the questions in part one of your study guide, okay? So that would be six questions in your study guide. You are responsible to go through it, okay? Which is, um, so if you keep your hand in the study guide on page 14 and turn to page 20, keep your hand in page 14 and turn to page 20, this begins part one, okay? Okay. So you'll see that um, you, this is pages 28 through 36 in the textbook. You see where it says part 1, the believer and his God? Under that it says pages 28 through 36. That's 8 or 9 pages in your textbook. You have 2 weeks to study those 8 or 9 pages, which covers about 6 questions and answers. Okay, And then go back to the study guide beginning on page 20. And then from page 20 to 23, you have to f just fill in those four pages, 20, 21, 22, and 23. Now, as time goes by, it's going to increase the amount of pages you'll have to do. But you have two weeks to do four pages. Now, obviously, uh, just because you have two weeks to do it doesn't mean... You could just sit down an hour before the class <laughs> and just do it. No, because remember the, the, the differences in the two philosophies of education. The secular philosophy of education focuses on memorization and the biblical philosophy on meditation. Amen. Okay? You really got to think and meditate to bring these things down inside of you before you give an answer. Jeff? Well, you keep saying two weeks. It looks like we're meeting next week. No, uh, some of your, I had to redo the schedule, it's the 24th. I made a mistake okay. on that initial one I gave out, I redid it and sent, uh, put it in the new handout from last Sunday, which you probably didn't get that. Uh, the only mistake I made on that class schedule is the uh, second class is on May 24th, not the 17th. 
the other dates are correct. Okay, I apologize for that. That's right. Okay, so I now. I want to make sure I don't show up. I see it. Right. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. I would be uh, having to eat a large slice of humble pie. Well, that would be a that problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so turning back uh, to page uh, 4, or rather page 14, page 14 in your study guide. The primary objective at the top of page 14, a specific requirement, before you begin, a specific requirement. The primary objective in studying a Baptist catechism is to have each student know the Word of God. This is possible only if the student has an open Bible <coughs> and will, without exception, faithfully turn to every page of Scripture associated with every point made. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. So every point that's being made in every Scripture that's given, you've got to turn to it and read it. This is not something you skim by. We're going. We're plunging. We've been. Some of us have been skimming, but now we're going to plunge and go deep into the underwater. That means you're immersing your mind deeply in the Word. You're going to think about those verses and so forth. Please make sure you do this. Though th such a process is more time-consuming, it is also more profitable. At the end of the study, you will be asked to give an account of yourself on this matter. May the Lord give you grace to honor this specific requirement and teach you much needed patience. There will be a spiritual reward if you honor this specific course requirement, and that is an increase of biblical knowledge while growing in personal faith. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. General pattern of the study guide. Now, when you go through this study guide, okay, you're going to see a general pattern in each for each chapter. You're going to requ be required fourth, to do four things for each question or chapter that you look at. It's broken down into review, reflection and discussion, personal application, and memory work. All right, for example, let's turn to uh, page 20. Back to page 20. Okay? Keeping your hand in page 14. Turn to page 20. You see at the top there, Believer in His God, pages 28 through 36. What's the first thing under that? It says review, right? So the first question there, what four attributes of God can only be known through the scripture? Where do you get that answer? No. Nope. Ultimately the Bible. In the catechism. Your, your textbook. And it's giving you the pages where that answer is found, pages 28 through, through 36. Usually Dr. Stan doesn't have you jump back and forth. Usually it's in order of the actual material presented in the textbook. So it's usually going to be at the beginning of that question where the first the answer is found for question one. Okay? So um, the four attributes that are listed in the textbook, you write them down in your answer sheet here in your study guide. See four bullet points? You write those four attributes down right there. Boom, 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 boom. Okay? Now what is this doing? What what is this method of catechism and then forcing you to go back into the book find the answer it's forcing your mind to find the answer and let's say you can't find it right away he makes it easy for you but let's say you can't find the answer right it's driving your mind deep into thinking and searching and once you find the answer you're thinking about it you're not just to write it down and then go on to the next hurry let's no think about the answer and then you're required to look up scripture in connection with it so that's going back to the scripture now. First you're in the book, now you're going to the scripture and you're going even deeper. So it's making you work to, to, to get your mind continually deep into the word. Question two, what five gospel truths does the scripture sufficiently reveal about what individuals need to know? Answer, the scripture sufficiently reveals what individuals need to know and then you find the answer in the text. You see, Dr. Downing has written all these things down concerning uh, the answers to these questions. Usually it's not one, usually one or two answers. He comes up with three, four, five, seven, ten aspects or components about a particular truth. So you're not usually just going to get, you know, the, the first surface salient answer. You're going to get many different shades and sides of the truth. It's going to fill you out, okay? And, and you go, and, all right, so that's the review. Then the second 
aspect of the format Dr. Stan uses in the study guide is reflection and discussion. So you answer all, let's see, let's see, there's six, seven questions, right? And then on page 22, the second section in his format is reflection and discussion. So now you just gave all the answers. So if you don't meditate on the answers when you looked them up in the book and wrote them down in the study guide, we're forcing you to do that right now in the reflection. You're being forced to reflect. Do you know how the flesh is? Oh, I know what Pastor Joe said, but I don't have time right now. <laughs> okay, wait till you get to reflection and discussion. <laughs> Number one, do you agree with the premise that the proper starting point in theology is with the scriptures? So not only are we talking about the infallibility and errancy part of the scriptures, but now we're, we're, we're bringing in some apologetic dimension to it here. Because concerning presuppos presuppositional apologetics, we all need to start by agreeing that the scriptures is our, is our standard. Okay. So, so he's asking you personally, do you agree with that? Do you agree? And so you're forced to think about your convictions. Wait a minute, I don't know, I never heard that. Oh, I heard about it, but... So you're being forced to decide, am I going to be, am I going to understand this? Am I going to agree with it? Am, am I going to be convicted about it? We're getting it, we're getting this truth down in and making it a part of you. We're forming your convictions. We're challenging you to reassess what you believe and to be clear about what you believe and then to be convicted about what you believe. Harry. So we're not going to be uh, presenting none of our homework like you said we're going to do it and then we just... No, you bring it with you. We're going to have, we're going to discuss it in class. We're going to go through it. But we're not going to go so deeply into it. We're going to, we're going to have to be moving on some of these longer uh, sections we do. But we'll, we'll, we may not discuss every single answer. No, we're going to be discussing them in class. So if you didn't do it, you're going to have egg on your face because you're, you're, you're not going to be with us as we go through it. Okay, Larry. Pastor Joe, I prefer to use a keyboard to do the thing instead of writing. That's fine. Okay, so what I, my question was, I can easily do it as a, you know, as a side thing. But yeah. is this actually on a Word document that, where we could go in there and then... I can, if any of you want me to email this study guide to you, I can. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, send me an email and request it, and I will email it to you, and you could just type in the answers in here if you want to do it that way. That's fine. It's just easier than writing. Yeah, no problem. Just send me an email and request the study guide. Uh, no problems. Okay? You can do it that way. So now, reflection and discussion. Look at question uh, two. Is true spirituality essentially <coughs> intellectual? Or is true spirituality ultimately a matter of faith? Wow. Have you ever asked yourself that question? Boy, we're going to have some interesting class discussion, aren't we? <laughs> Look at three. Now, this is each, each time, each, each, each question. What should be said to the person who believes that religion in general and Christianity in particular is irrational? So here we, here we go apologetics again. You see... Dr. Stan and I, if you read the short history of the seminary, we came up with a format because of some of the deficiency in our contemporary seminary system. There are good seminaries out there, don't get me wrong, and they're really trying to bring in practical uh, application for, for poor pastors who, who get it all theological, 99%, and have no practical. They're trying to bring in, and I see some of that, and I praise God for that. But we've designed a system here where you get the theology, and then you're forced to really reflect upon these questions and uh, we apply them to you spiritually and personally, okay, in the reflection and discussion part. And then if you turn the page, okay, part of the, uh, the, the third part of the format is personal application, heart work, okay? Mm -hmm. we, we focus on the heart because the head stuff must trickle down to the heart, right? So we have heart work. Please prayerfully respond to each question. We mean that. We mean that. We want you to pray about these things. Uh, and we have scripture here. For we would, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Question number one, under the personal application and heart work, do the scriptures have their proper place in your life? Do they? Or do you like pick and choose? You believe in the infallibility and inerrancy, but when it, it comes to practical application, you kind of pick and choose. I'm not saying it does, but this is what 
the personal application questions that forces you to be honest and reflect and then revise and adjust your convictions and your lifestyle accordingly. Amen? Amen. Number two, does your life reflect the guidance and transforming power of the Bible? You know, this is all related to the doctrine of the scriptures. We're bringing out practical application. Can you imagine if you took this study guide and this textbook and you had your own Bible study teaching these things and you have all the personal practical questions right here that you can ask your participants. It's all been thought out. You can add your own stuff, sure, but it's all here. Number three, do you love and obey God as he is revealed in his word? All these practical questions are related to the scriptures as they apply to your own life. And then there's a fourth section in the format for each question down at the bottom of page 23. Scripture memorization. Who said we didn't love or like memorization? <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of that. We, we insist you memorize at least one verse every, every question. So every part and every part that you do. There's ten parts, okay, for seven for this course. So you're required to memorize that scripture for next week, okay? It's, it's all head and heart work. You're, you're, you're being driven down into the word in this course, okay? <clears throat> now, let's continue. We only have a few minutes left. Um, so you see the format. There's In every single question, there's review, reflection, personal application, and memory work, all right? So it's going to take some time, at least a few hours a week, I would say, maybe three to four. It's not a whole lot. But our discretionary time, when you factor in job and family and other important responsibility, is limited. So the three to four hours a week is going to come out of that discretionary time. So I encourage you to use your time wisely. Okay? Because you're defeating your own purpose. Okay? So if you complete all the assignments, you get a grade you get an uh, A for the course. If you miss one assignment, you go down by one grade. Okay? You get a B. If you miss two, you get a C. If you miss three, you get a D. If you get a miss four, you get an F. I am going to give you a grade. You know, when I first started, uh, first came up with this philosophy, and I shared it with Dr. Stan, you know, I was all against, you know, all grades, you know, letter grades, number grades, they don't mean anything because it's a matter of what you know. But I found over a period of 10 to 15 years, and I've, I've been convicted about this format and this philosophy for a long time, I found that that's nice, but in practical application, you know, people are just, in general, especially overseas, not that motivated to learn. So I said, your degree, and, you know, but we want the seminary students to be accountable. We want their spiritual progress, their spiritual development to be monitored and measured. And they, we want them to be accountable and challenged. We want to see if they're spiritually fit and called to be pastors. Um, and we want to mark that fitness by checking their progress every once in a while. Okay? Um, let's see. Uh, let's keep reading here in this... this uh, Third paragraph, the purpose is to interact with the text, but a mentor, Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Without encouragement and personal accountability, the study of a Baptist catechism will be merely an academic exercise. There must be more to spiritual studies than rote memorization and regurgitation of the material. The Word of God must take hold of the inner man Amen. in order for the soul to feed and feast upon the glories of the true Word, even our Lord Jesus Christ. I asked Stan to articulate what our philosophy is, and he did a great job. Because any study of God's Word should include praise and devotion, select songs have been inserted into the body of material. I would like to encourage the mentor and the student to sing the songs privately or better yet together. Okay? Finally, uh, a word must be said about some of the questions raised for reflection and discussion. Some of the questions are deliberately challenging in nature to the material set forth in a Baptist catechism because the mentor and the student will have to respond to, in, in this case it's just you and the Lord, uh, to challengers of the Baptist faith and traditions. Providing provocative questions for thoughtful reflection and discussion at this time will force the mentor and the student, in this case the student, to return to the Bible as the ultimate defense of every point being made. 
Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone, solo, soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. A prolific and gifted writer, Dr. Downing, has given to the church in general and to Baptist in particular another important book. The reader of this uh, Baptist Catechism and Commentary will be blessed and formed and humbled by the breadth of knowledge of Dr. Downing and the spiritual insights he now offers. May the Lord bless you. Stanford, Merle, Vieira, Florida. Okay, so are there any questions now on any of the material, the format, how to take the course, what you're required to do? I'm going to send an email. What we're Just briefly, in next week, which is week two, you're required to do part one. Week three, part two, week four, part three, week five, part four, week six, part five, week seven, part six. Now in week eight, since uh, we're going to do part seven, questions 78 through 107, because uh, the last section is very long. And then week nine, part eight, questions 108 through 33. I'm just letting you know that. I will email that to you. That's scheduled to you. So you'll have it right there, and you'll know what's required of you each and every class session. Okay, closing questions. We're right on schedule. I'm going to try real hard to stay on schedule. Yes? Yes? Uh, you said that for next for the next meeting we're supposed to do part one. Yes. What are we skipping introduction? Um, well, let's look at this for a second. Go to page uh, 16. sixteen. Page sixteen, which covers pages seventeen through twenty-seven in the textbook. All right. So. Um, I, I was hoping to be able to just cover this today. But well, we don't have time because I want to keep my word and end now. We did start early. I mean, a little late. Though. We did start a little late. So in in the, I'll just take a couple of extra minutes on page 16. Uh, in since you were not able to do this, I didn't expect you to have it done. <laughs> okay. So what we're looking at is basic information on the format and study of this course. Some historical information. Define the word, the English word catechism. Um, Dr. Downing in the book goes over uh, some particulars, like uh, he talks about Spurgeon and uh, as an example of orthodoxy um, versus heterodoxy. What will happen if Christians arrive at a consistent doctrinal knowledge? He talks about that. In the first uh, part of the book, the introduction of the book, Dr. Downing gives a lot of important reasons why we should study the Word of God in a deeper way, and uh, whether it be in a catechism format or otherwise. And then um, he gives some scriptures, page 17, state two worthy objectives uh, for uh, people with regard to the study of, of the Bible. Number six, list nine, the ninefold purpose of a catechism. Number seven, list six groups that will benefit from the use. So he talks about the importance of a catechism. Same with question eight. So uh, a lot of introductory material, uh, preparatory material. I highly recommend that you go through this just as a prelude. It's not going to be required of you, but I highly recommend that you do the introduction as well. The introduction is not part of parts one through uh, seven. It is just an introduction, and uh, so I didn't include it, but I recommend that you do it. I was going to go over it a little bit with you here. Obviously, we weren't going to go over it in detail, but uh, you're welcome, and you are urged to do the introduction. Okay? Any other questions? I'll just make one comment, because before I saw that, it's real important that you read that introduction, because... Yeah, you got to read yeah, the he introduction. He really breaks down that, what catechism means, yeah. and then he... As succinct as everything else is, he gets pretty thorough on just that word catechism for the first few chapters, and it's very edifying. We um, have some down. statements of faith. The his history of the church uh, has uh, laid up some uh, a legacy in catechisms, statements of faith, and uh, con church uh, yeah statements of faith. The Westminster, the Belgic. The uh, London Baptist uh, of 1689, uh, 1644, and others that are really good statements of faith. Some of them are presented in the form of a catechism, question and answer. The Westminster Catechism is an excellent statement of faith. The Shorter Catechism is as well, um, which reduces uh, the, the larger catechism into a smaller uh, form. But uh, 
it, I agree with you. Read the introduction. You're going to need to read it in the book. Don't skip ahead in the book. You're going to need to read the book anyway from beginning to end. Okay, any, any last important questions? You have the format. You understand that. Uh, no other questions? Okay. Make sure you have signed the sign-up sheet and you filled out the information form. Did everyone fill out the information form? Okay. Brother Walter, I'll ask you to close in prayer. like Dr. Downing, who has spent years and, and then saw the vision and mm. even convicted to write this book and, and get this onto uh, paper to help us in our study and handling of the Word of God. Help us to find a good balance in reading the Catechism and using that to guide us, but really meditating upon your Word and thinking about those scriptural references and having a more systematic view of you so that we can love you more. Mm. That ultimately this all comes back to how can we love you if we don't even know you? Well, we may have very vague thoughts of you. But if we can see you more clearly, then we can love you more dearly, as, as, a, as a popular song would say. But, but how true that is, that we want to see your brilliance. We want to see facets of your just who you are and what you've chosen to reveal to us may keep us also humble in all of our studies mm. too, mm. often it is easy for this to puff up knowledge right. puffs up uh, but keep us really humble and understanding and, and graceful and communicating with others who may not know some of these things just, it's just a great great privilege that you've given us <coughs> help us to find the time in our busy lives to uh, set aside this proper time for you to instruct us by your Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, one and all. God bless you in your studies. I should have plugged that thing in in the first place. Is there anybody that's leaving?